Welcome to um, our Agile Leadership and Business Agility Meetup. Meetup number, I don't know what this is, like 14 or 15, something like that. We've been going a little while now, just in time to catch the uh, the lockdown, I think we started. So we, we kicked off the, uh, the meetup and then uh, we had um, absolutely zero in person. All right, so, uh, but there we go. We, we live in hope that one day we'll be able to do that. So welcome. Today, I'm not gonna get in the way uh, too much. Um, I'm just gonna kind of do my thing at the start and the end because as ever, I know nobody's come to hear me talking, uh, come to hear the main event. So let's do it. But a little bit of housekeeping before we do. Uh, before, uh, before we go, if uh, we can default to being on mute, please, that would be really good because as much as we wanna hear your dogs barking and your, uh, your children screaming, um, it might be slightly easier if we, uh, if we have you muted there. Of course, feel free to unmute yourself if, uh, if uh, you're called on to, uh, to ask a question. So, um, but if we can stay on mute and if at all possible, uh, we can keep cameras on, that would be really great. So we can see who's here and we can interact like almost like we're in the same place that which uh, doesn't happen very often. Uh, so uh, uh, thank you, a little bit of admin there. Um, if you would like to post questions during the talk, we have a chat function, I'll do my best to make sure that I capture those questions and that we put them to Richard at the end. So uh, feel free to do that. Um, otherwise, that is the entirety of the rules we have here. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to turn over to our speaker now. Okay, and, um, and so I have known Richard for many years. Um, we, uh, we tend to meet mainly at conferences um, and a few training courses around the world. And, uh, Always tend to uh, always tend to gravitate and to towards the trouble. Um, and uh, he is based out in Virginia, so uh, we appreciate you uh, joining us at the uh, awkward time zone for you. Based out in Virginia, uh, it does a lot of work in, with, in DC uh, with the with the U.S. government, or certainly has done. Has been a CST for some time, and actually uh, very generously helped me on my journey to to becoming a CST. Uh, and so uh, he's got a. A, a, a sort of a truckload of experience and uh, hoping that he'll impart some of his pearls on us today. So uh, uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn over to uh, our, our speaker tonight, Mr. Richard Cheng. Over to you, buddy. Great. Thank you. Let's see. I think everyone can hear me. Uh, let's start by doing this. In the chat window, type in where you are zooming in from. So for me, I am zooming in from Reston, Virginia, here in the USA. So in the chat window, type in where you're zooming in from. I think we have an international crowd. I recognize quite a few faces. Laura there coming in from California, I believe. Is that right? And Sasan here from my area. It's great. Awesome. Oh, great. We have people from all over. London, obviously. Great. Athens. Oh, I love Athens. California, Bay Area, UK, Germany, Istanbul. That's nice. Ottawa. I've been to Ottawa before. Paris kind of makes me miss uh, travel quite a bit. Well, welcome to my session, everyone. Uh, Kareem, quick question for you. Do the folks have the ability to put themselves off mute or are they muted the whole time? Good question. We should probably test that because I'm not normally in the driving seat, but uh, my understanding is you can unmute yourself. Looks like someone just did. So yes, we can. I think I can unmute myself if you can hear me. I think me. so. Awesome. Yeah. We can hear you. Perfect. Works. Great. So yeah, so in this session, uh, there'll be times where I'm going to ask for questions and get, uh, ask for thoughts. So if when I do, feel free to unmute yourself and, and uh, chime in. Also, feel free to chime in via chat as well. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome. Uh, my session today is me on business agility, pivot or perish. Uh, let me introduce myself very quickly. Actually, let me introduce the agenda very quickly. So we're going to start. I'm going to first introduce myself. Uh, we're going to talk about the need for business agility. We'll define business agility. We'll get, uh, go over some of the uh, uh, kind of concepts or enablers, as Kareem would call it, for business agility. And we'll end with some closing thoughts and Q&A. Uh, as we start, let me introduce myself. My name is Richard Chang. I'm an agile trainer and coach by background based out here in the uh, DC area, right? I live in Virginia, right outside Washington, DC. Uh, I have a series of certifications, uh, none, of none of which are really relevant for this session, uh, but a lot of my background is in commercial, uh, nonprofit and association, as well as government work as well. Uh, fun fact about me was that I, I was doing Brazilian Jiu Jitsu up until the pandemic, and now I'm vaccinated. I plan to go back at some point, just trying to get my lazy butt up and actually do that again gotten very uh, lethargic this past year. So trying to get myself motivated to do stuff like that again. Uh, 
Uh, that's a bit about me. Here's my contact information. I am going to copy and paste this into the chat window. So if anyone wants to reach out to me, you can do so. Feel free to uh, follow me on Twitter. Feel free to join me on LinkedIn. There's my contact info. So you guys all have that. So let's talk a bit about the need for business agility. So uh, this is a story I think Kareem and I both heard when we were at the Strategizer Master Course in um, London a few years ago. But there's two companies, Kodak and Fujifilm. So years ago, both were uh, phenomenally, uh, phenomenally successful organizations, both Kodak and Fujifilm. In fact, uh, Kodak was the company that invented uh, the digital camera. However, that ended up becoming kind of their downfall as well, because what happened was Kodak in its prime had over 100,000 employees, over a billion in cash reserves, over a billion worth of uh, patents and IP. And like I mentioned earlier, they invented the digital camera. Uh, that was back in the day. Kodak of today, they're still around kind of. Uh, they've declared bankruptcy several times. They're still around. But in today's world, what we have here is a company with less than 5,000 employees, uh, sold most of its patents, uh, sold almost all its intellectual property. And like I mentioned, that filed for bankruptcy several times now. It's still in the midst of restructuring, trying to find their footing. They're nowhere near the Kodak they once were. Right? Now, on the other hand, we have Fujifilm, who was also successful at Kodak. And what happened with Fujifilm was uh, decades ago, uh, they pivoted. They realized that um, uh, a lot of the raw materials they had on hand for uh, processing of uh, film uh, was exact same raw materials we used in another industry. So they pivoted to another industry and became wildly successful in that industry. Anyone other than Kareem know what the pivot was? Anyone know what uh, Fuji Film pivoted to and one of the lines of business that became wildly successful? Anyone have a clue? I think I have a clue, but it's also taken from Kareem's class. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> I think it has to do with uh, medi cosmetical stuff. That's med exactly it. That's exactly it. So uh, Fujifilm pivoted, uh, like Harris pointed out. And uh, what they realized was all the raw ingredients they had on hand for um, making their uh, film is essentially the, is, uh, more or less the same raw ingredients we use in cosmetics. And so what they did decades ago is they created a cosmetic uh, division, Acelift, which to today ends up being one of their most profitable lines of business. Now, here in the U.S., we're not as familiar with them. I think they're very big in uh, Asia, uh, but apparently it is very successful and kind of showed their ability to pivot into a different dimension. And now today, Fujifilm is actually a very uh, thriving company. Uh, one of my clients in the past was uh, Marriott. So Marriott, uh, back in the day, had the most listing, most rental listings on the internet by far. Uh, in today's world, it's no longer Marriott, right? It's Airbnb. And what's interesting is Airbnb has more listings on the internet than the next five brands combined, right? The funny thing is Marriott never properly saw Airbnb coming. They thought the competition was Hyatt, Hilton, uh, the Sheridans of the world. And by the time they realized uh, what Airbnb was doing, Airbnb already had critical mass. Marriott today actually is doing uh, reselling um, property, re-renting property. It's actually kind of a cool idea. They're re-renting property like villas and stuff, kind of the high-end market. It's actually pretty neat. But right now, the problem is Airbnb has such a massive foothold that, uh, well, you can see the numbers right there. Right? In fact, uh, over a year ago, March of 2020, right? This is, uh, this is my house right here. This is where I'm set up as of right now. Uh, March of 2020, right? What we had was a global pandemic hit everyone. And what we saw was basically overnight, almost every company in the world had to migrate from an in-person workforce to a virtual. And what we saw there was some companies were able to make that transition really well and others really struggle with it, all right? So all this shows that in today's world, right? Well, the only thing that we really know is uncertainty, right? That's just always gonna be there. That calls out a need for business agility. Uh, Kareem and I, John is here as well. It's Kareem, John and I did a class with Mike Beadle years ago um, and it was a really good class. It was about enterprise scrum. Um, and Be uh, Mike Beadle had some really good thoughts on um, business agility. And one of them was this uh, statement right here. We're in class and Mike says this. Uh, when someone says they have 30 years of business experience, the danger is they're doing business like we did 30 years ago, right? Which is a great point. Where we are now is just way different 
than the where we were 30 years ago, right? Their Marriott's of the world never saw Airbnb coming, right? The taxi uh, cabs of the world never saw the Ubers and Lyfts, Lyfts coming. It's just a different thing. So a lot of this talks for the need for business agility. So let's talk about this a bit. First, let's define what business agility really means. This is from the uh, uh, Agile Business Consortium. Uh, business agility uh, is us as an organization able to adapt quickly to market changes, both internally and externally, uh, responding rapidly and effectively to our customer needs uh, to adapt and lead uh, a change uh, in a productive and effective way without compromising our product and, and continuously be at an, a competitive advantage, right? These are some of the core concepts around uh, business agility. And so we're going to talk about this today. And to borrow from Kareem Harbutt, who has a book out, um, shameless plug, Kareem, let me get your book. Uh, have you read it yet? I have not. But you know what? My kid rearranged my room the other day, and I don't know where he put it. Well, you'll see the reference later. Six key enablers of business agility. Here I have seven, although our enablers are a bit different. We'll talk about that towards the end of the session. Oh, here it is. Here's the book. Six key enablers of business agility. We'll talk about this as we go. Signed by the author. This thing's going to be worth tens of dollars at some point right there. It's going to be awesome. So we're going to talk about these key enablers of business agility uh, as we go. Now, before I jump in, any questions for me before I jump in? to these key enablers. All right, let's jump in. So let's first talk about some concepts. Let's talk about Agile first. Uh, for some of you, this will be a very uh, brief um, um, reminder. For some of you, it might be a bit new. In the chat window, type in yes if you've seen this before. Type in no if this is brand new to you. In the chat window, type in yes if you've seen the Agile Manifesto before. Type in no if you have never seen this before. This is your first exposure to it. OK, great. Everyone has yeses. Awesome. So take a second just to read this to yourself. And as you read this to yourself, think about what it is about this you might like. But think about any questions, thoughts, or concerns this raises in you as well. So take a moment to read this to yourself. Think about what it is about this you might like. But think about any questions, thoughts, or concerns this might raise as well. All right, so as you read this, anyone think to themselves, hmm, it's not that I don't like this, but there are some questions, thoughts, and concerns. Any questions, thoughts, and concerns from the group? Oh, feel free to say it out loud. You might be on mute, uh, or you can type your questions, thought, or concern in the chat window. Yeah, it's a good point. So uh, one thing to note here is that uh, there's a note in the chat saying time to change from software to product. The roots of this are in software development, but in today's world, we've extended this far outside software. So what I tell people is here it says uh, developing software. Think of it as developing product or developing value. Here, instead of working software, think of it as working product or delivery of value. Yeah. Uh, other questions or thoughts about this? Just one important note here is that uh, we are not ignoring these items on the right. That's what the last line says. Uh, it's what happens here is that the items on the right are things we do, uh, but where we see the real value, where we want our culture to be is on the left. Things on the right are things we do, but the focus and culture should be on the left. That's what we can do to help maximize our ability to deliver effective products. Right. Now, one layer deeper are the 12 principles behind the Agile Manifesto. If I had more time, I'd go deep into this. If you really want to learn more about these principles, I recommend a class like the uh, Scrum Master course, the CSM course uh, does a deep dive into this. Uh, but what I will highlight is when this thing was created in 2001, the original um, draft had this thing split into three dimensions. The first set of principles were slanted toward the customers. So here you have principles like uh, delivering our product early and continuously, uh, welcoming change in requirements, um, preferring shorter timeframes for delivering our products and the business and technology working together daily to deliver products. These are all things that are slanted towards the customers. Uh, then here, what they did in terms of segmenting their uh, principles is they have one segment that said slanted towards the managers. Here, it's about building teams around motivated individuals. 
having face-to-face -face as the most effective form of communication. In today's world, where everyone's more virtual, uh, what I recommend is all the tools in place to allow for virtual face-to-face, -face, screen sharing, instant messaging, collaboration portals, and such. The working product as a primary measure of progress and having a sustainable pace uh, so we don't have these ups and downs we so, see so much in our projects. These are all slanted towards uh, the managers or the organization. Slanted toward the cost, the team is paying uh, attention to technical excellence and good design. Simplicity, don't do everything at once, maximizing the amount of work not done. Don't do all your requirements at once. Don't do all your design at once. Don't do all your architecture at once. Build just enough for now with an eye towards tomorrow. Uh, Self-organizing teams, don't tell teams what to do. Tell them what we want. Let them uh, build it. And Agile inherently cheats. Number 12 says, uh, at regular intervals, we inspect and get better. So if we don't like something on our Agile teams, we reflect, inspect, and get better. Right? These are the 12 principles behind the Agile Manifesto. So all this is to say that Agile, as most of some of you know, isn't something we can do. Agile, think of it more as a mindset. It's a way of thinking. It's a philosophy or mental approach based on these 12 principles, these four value points, underneath which we have Agile methods like Scrum, like Kanban, like XP. Those would be the methods. Agile is the mindset. Yeah. Any questions about that? Just a quick overview of Agile. So that Agile mindset uh, helps us really understand moving away from kind of these predictive models into developing products that meet our users' needs. The Agile mindset's a big part of that, as well as Agile methods. There's different Agile methods out there, Scrum, Kanban, XP. We're gonna talk about a real quick overview of Scrum. So um, who here is in the chat window, give me a yes if you've worked in Waterfall before, give me a no if you've never worked in Waterfall. In the chat window, give me a yes if you've worked in Waterfall before. Okay, great. So a lot of you are familiar with this. So Agile, Waterfall isn't a bad model. Uh, it's bad at certain things though, one of which is change. Water, uh, waterfall is what we call a predictive model. It's relatively okay if we know everything up front and can execute against it without changing anything. Waterfall in that model isn't the, the worst, but what happens is waterfall is very difficult, especially when it comes to feedback loops and change. And so a uh, method like Scrum helps with that. Here's Scrum at a high level. At the very top, we have a product vision, recently renamed the product goal at the very top. Um, the roadmap, the release layers, the sprint level, our day-to-day, -day, that's the uh, Scrum big picture. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna work together real quick to go over the details of Scrum. So here in the Scrum framework picture, uh, we're gonna solve the uh, fill in the blanks together very quickly, but to uh, kind of uh, walk you through it, uh, the iconography on this is such where one, three, and six, all the triangles represent my scrum roles. Uh, two, five, and 10, the circles represent the artifacts. And uh, all the squares represents my events or activities. So what I'll do is I'll describe each one. And what you can do is type in your answers in the chat. So number one is the role in scrum responsible for bringing in the voice of the end users, the customers, the stakeholders, and the organization, and kind of prioritizing that and working with the team to ensure what we're building is a valuable product. What is number one? Type your answer into the chat window. All right, awesome. Product owner is correct. Number two is the artifact in Scrum that stores all the needs and wants we have for the product that we have not yet started bringing into our sprint. What is number two? What's the artifact that stores all the needs and wants for our product. Uh, very nice. Whoever wrote Jira, that is a bad answer. Jira is a bad answer. It is not Jira. That's funny. It is backlog. It is the product backlog. It is the product backlog. And you just can't say backlog in itself. It's not sufficient. You'll see why in about three minutes. It is the product backlog. Bonus question. What does PBI stand for? Bonus question to the group. What does PBI stand for? In the chat window, what does... Product backlog items is correct. In some environments, you may hear referred to as stories or user stories, which technically is a format for writing PBIs. All the items in a product backlog are called PBIs. Good. Number three is the role in Scrum responsible for delivering the product and doing the, est uh, the estimation. What is number three? 
Ah, the dev team is correct. Although recently it's been renamed developers. So you may hear referred to as the Scrum development team or developers. The uh, November 2020 version of Scrum Guide renamed that role to developers. Ideal developer uh, team size is uh, 10 or fewer, 10 or fewer. Number, oh, by developers, quick note, we don't just mean the coders, we mean all team members working together to develop solutions. On a software team, it might include people with a testing background, people with a UI UX design background, people with uh, as analysts, backend developers, front-end developers. We're all developers working together to develop the solution. Um, number four, what is the first meeting we have to kick off the sprint? Sprint planning is correct. It typically comes in two parts, although the recent version of Scrum Guide talks about the determining sprint goal, determining what we bring into the sprint, and uh, determining how we do it. Number five, what's the artifact that stores all of our... Uh, number five is the artifact that stores the team's plan for the sprint. What is number five? Sprint backlog is correct. Awesome. Uh, as we go in, number seven, is what the event that happens daily that allows the team to sync up for the day. What is number seven? The event that happens daily, whoops. It is daily scrum. Number six, I skipped ahead. Number six is the role in scrum responsible for removing impediments. Scrum master is correct. Number eight is the real-time act requirements management. What is number eight? Real-time act requirements management, number eight. This is where in Scrum, ah, all right, Michael, you're on the right track. Backlog grooming, except we call it something else in Scrum, but you're on the right track. It is product backlog refinement, often known as grooming, often known as grooming. Coming out of the sprint, number nine is the meeting we have to close out the sprint, where we invite our end users, customers, and stakeholders in. What is number nine? Sprint reviews, correct. Number 10 is what we deliver at the end of every sprint. What do we deliver at the end of every sprint? Uh, number 10 is an artifact, product increment is correct. Last piece, number 11 is the meeting we have where we inspect and adapt the process. What is number 11? The retro is correct. This is the Scrum framework, quick review of Scrum. Uh, any questions about the framework? One quick note about this is that in some of your environments, in some of your environments, you may have slightly different words. Here where it says PBIs, you might refer to them as stories or user stories. Here where it says sprints, you sometimes hear it referred to as iterations. Instead of daily scrum, sometimes you hear daily stand-up. Instead of refinement, sometimes you're grooming. Instead of review, sometimes you hear demo. Probably means the same thing, but everything you see up here is the official scrum terminology. Any questions about scrum? Great. When you're doing um, Agile, uh, Scrum is the most popular Agile method out there, but any organization that does it uh, is going to have elements of Scrum teams as well as Kanban teams. I'm not going to talk about Kanban in this session, uh, but any organization that does Agile will likely have a combination of some Scrum teams building out products as well as Kanban teams helping operationalize and deliver other products as well. Now, with that said, Let's go into design thinking. And to start this off, we are going to watch a video. So I'm going to share a video about design thinking. Uh, give me one second while I bring up the video. All right, I assume that everyone here knows Korean, because if you don't, it's going to get really awkward. So here's a video on design thinking. Sarah 이건 이렇게 만드는 게 낫지 않아? 
다시 3개월 동안 사장님의 의견을 반영해 열심히 제품을 만듭니다. 기획자가 열심히 기획을 하고 디자이너가 열심히 디자인을 하고 엔지니어가 열심히 개발을 합니다. 3개월 후 다시 사장님에게 제품을 보여줍니다. 아주 만족스럽군요. 그럼 이제 제품을 시장에 출시해 볼까요? 6개월의 혼신과 열정이 담긴 제품을 사용자에게 보여줍니다. 어? 그런데 고객이 마음에 들지 않나 보네요. 하, 제가 필요한 건 이런 제품이 아니라고요. 6개월 동안 열심히 만든 제품이 필요가 없다니 참으로 슬픈 일이군요. 여기서 잠깐! 보통 이런 문제는 잘못된 문제 정의에서 비롯되는 경우가 많습니다. 그렇다면 올바른 문제 정의를 위해서는 어떤 방식으로 일해야 할까요? 우선 기획자, 디자이너, 엔지니어가 각자의 일에만 집중하는 것이 아니라 한자리에 모여 수평적인 커뮤니케이션을 할수 있어야 합니다. 아, 그뿐만이 아니죠. 가장 중요한 것은 사용자에 대한 공감을 통해 사용자가 필요로 하는 해결책을 제시하는 것입니다. 프로젝트의 초기부터 사용자를 면밀히 관찰하고 사용자 입장에서 제품을 만들어 가야 합니다. 사용자가 만족할 때까지 아이디어를 내고 프로토타입을 만들고 사용자와 함께 테스트하며 완성도를 높여갑니다. 사용자가 만족할 때까지 아이디어를 내고 프로토타입을 만들고 사용자와 함께 테스트하며 완성도를 높여갑니다. 사용자가 만족할 때까지 아이디어를 내고 프로토타입을 만들고 사용자와 함께 테스트하며 완성도를 높여갑니다. 우리는 이런 업무 방식을 사람 중심으로 함께하는 혁신이라고 말합니다. 
a serial entrepreneur who created the Lean Startup Movement to help startups allocate their resources more effectively. Startups are not about coming up with a brilliant idea and becoming an overnight success as many articles might have you believe. Entrepreneurship, in fact, is much more about testing and learning faster than your competitors. Most startups fail, but much of that failure is avoidable. And the Lean Startup is the methodology that helps entrepreneurs avoid failure. The reason why many startups fail is that they operate based on a conventional approach to management. Traditionally, doing your market research, coming up with a solid strategy, and delivering a great product works. But it doesn't work with startups, because it assumes that you already know what the market wants. And the moment you make that assumption, you're doomed to failure. You will waste too much time and money developing the perfect product before you realize that there's no market for it. The Lean Startup methodology is based on a rinse and repeat type of cycle. Build, measure, learn. Build a product, measure your customers' reactions, and learn if your idea has been validated or if you need to adapt. Repeat the cycle until your customers send you a clear signal that your product fits a market need, the much coveted product market fit. Before embarking on this journey, start by considering what are two or three key assumptions that you're making that will determine your startup success, and what is the cheapest and fastest way to test them. Once you've designed your test, build your minimum viable product, or MVP. That's not a product you'd be proud of, far from it. It just needs the critical features for your test to yield meaningful results. The singular role of the MVP is to play its part in your test. After you have an MVP, you need a good way to measure your customers' reactions. In order to avoid any biases after you've collected the data, it's best to come up with a baseline of metrics up front. If you're measuring conversions or email signups, how many do you need to consider the test a success? Be clear about what success and failure look like, because it's going to be much harder to distinguish between the two later. And finally, assess what you learned. Should you pivot or persevere? If your assumptions are confirmed, you're off to the races and you can focus on refining the product. But if one of your key assumptions is proven wrong, you may have to pivot. Change your idea or focus on a different customer segment and start the cycle over again. You may have to experiment more than you expected before you can find what your customers really want. Entrepreneurs often dive headfirst into an idea they're passionate about. Yet there's a more scientific approach to building a startup. Having a process to manage the chaos and uncertainties surrounding startups can be a lifesaver when you feel like you're struggling, swimming in the deep end. So there we saw a, a summary of the Lean Startup book. I have it here in my hand by Eric Ries. So a couple quick notes about this concept. I'm gonna share my screen again. So with Lean Startup, the concept is we have to, um, we identify something that we wanna build, right? And identify some critical assumptions in terms of the product we're putting out. And then what we wanna do is we wanna be able to validate, we wanna be able to test these assumptions as quickly as possible. Right. By testing these assumptions, what we can do is if assumptions are proven true, we can go ahead and uh, what Lean Startup, what the book says, persevere and proceed. If the assumptions are not proven true, we have to decide what we uh, do with these uh, new learnings, which often involve potentially pivoting to other areas. Right. Uh, this is from David Bland, I believe. Um, and in terms of assumptions, there's three dimensions he, uh, he points out in this Venn diagram which is uh, assumptions around desirability, do people want it, around feasibility, can we build it, viability, should we build it, and obviously the sweet spot is somewhere here in the middle. Now, one note about the Lean Startup is that it's called Lean Startup, right? And so there's a kind of a, a notion that this is great for startups, but it doesn't really apply if you're like in a larger organization. Uh, but I would suggest that in a large organization, uh, these ideas are critical as well. In fact, there was an article in Fortune magazine a couple of years ago that talked about uh, lean startup concepts. And what they highlighted is companies like GE, Procter Gamble, City Ventures, Intuit, Toyota, NSA, amongst others, are all large, massive enterprises uh, that have lean startup concepts uh, as they test out their products. So although the title is lean startup, it's not just for startups, it's really about being able to validate your ideas as early as possible. In fact, that concept itself has in the past caused an issue in the Agile community. Because you'll notice with Agile, 
right? What we want is working software, working product as quickly as possible. And so from an agile standpoint, remember in Scrum, right? Number 10 is we're delivering product increment, a sliver of the product as quickly as possible, right? And so in the past that there's been a bit of a, a butting of the heads with the lean startup crowd saying, we wanna test our assumptions as quickly as possible uh, with the agile crowd that says, no, we wanna get product out there as quickly as possible. So how do we reconcile that? So there's different concepts out there, uh, but one of the ideas I like a lot is this concept of um, what's called the rat testing or riskiest assumption testing. So in this value curve here, what you have at the beginning is we're gonna identify some key assumptions we wanna make, test those out first, right? And then from there, we're gonna dive very heavily into the business focus. And towards the end, you're delivering just capabilities that are not as important, right? And so even from an agile standpoint, I'm a big supporter of testing out our most critical assumptions first, right? To make sure that what we're doing is really the right thing, right? If you look at the agile big picture here, I would say even in this ideation period, before we even start doing things, we should use a lot of these design thinking and lean startup concepts to make sure what we're building is what users need, as well as major points, uh, basically the early and often. I wanna do it here at ideation, as well as throughout the project or product life cycle. Any questions about Lean Startup? All right, let's talk about DevOps. So DevOps involves a kind of a flow of uh, development into operations where really the base concept is the same team that owns the, uh, basically the same team owns the uh, product lifecycle from a kind of initiation from the funding to the business needs, to building it out, to testing, to releasing, to supporting, all in kind of one kind of, um, uh, well, you see it here with the infinity sign, one kind of uh, revolving cycle, right? And so what we're really trying to do here is really trying to use our DevOps concepts to shorten our time from, um, there's a book, I think it was the Poppendix from cash to, uh, from concept to cash, right? It's that concept to sh shorten that loop as quickly as possible. In fact, there are organizations that do it at a very high level. Companies like uh, Amazon, Salesforce, Netflix, Google, one of my clients, USCIS, releases production every day. It's really have that ability to get our products out there as quickly and effectively as possible. In fact, Amazon claims that um, they deploy to production every 11.7 seconds, right? Now, granted, it's probably more than one team, but what you see there is hyper DevOps capabilities, which makes sense since it's Amazon and they do have their own web services. Uh, a big part of that is also automation. And so uh, there's a joke I'm gonna tell, but no one's gonna laugh. Here's the joke. The joke is computers laugh when they see people testing, right? It's, it's nobody, none of you laughed. Just because what happens is uh, with automation, uh, we can do things just a lot faster in repeated patterns. Uh, here's one example on the continuous integration side. So here, uh, if we have a, a really, a uh, comprehensive set of automation in our continuous integration side. Here's the way this works. I'm a developer. I make a change. I check it into my version control. What that does is it automatically gets checked into the build server. It automatically kicks off my build, compile, unit test, integration test, will package it out, deploy, acceptance, analyze, build report. Everything's green because it's my code, works great. Now, Kareem is a developer. Kareem makes a change, goes to version control gets sent to the build server. We run a build, we compile it, compile's fine, shocker, run unit test, Kareem's unit test pass, another shocker, integration tests fail, not a surprise. So what happens here is Kareem broke the build again. And so now what happens is we all get an email that says once again, Kareem broke the build and that we're all now on the same page that, hey Kareem, please fix it, you broke the build again today. So what happens here in continuous integration is we have automation in place that does a lot of our uh, uh, checks for us. Right? Now, uh, also on the testing side, we wanna automate testing as much as possible. This is from Brian Merrick. This is the testing quadrants. So here on this uh, Y axis, we have kind of like this business facing with more of the business rules and technology facing, which is more kind of the back end uh, stuff. The support param, the critique in the product, this is test we run that actually tests the product itself. This is on this side, this uh, left side here, support programming. These are tests we run that test kind of the backend code, right? So what happens here, if you look at this quadrant, 
is that three of these four quadrants should be automated, right? The bottom left at the unit level, the component test and system test, those should be automated. And it's typically up to the developers to create automation in these areas. Uh, the bottom right, performance test, security test. In most environments I've been in, these are generally automated. You know, you're generally not getting 10,000 unique users to uh, do stress testing against a system. Uh, general performance tests, security tests are mostly automated. And many organizations are done by like a third party, like a network group or security group often will do this. The functional tests and acceptance tests, we would like to see these automated as well, but this requires a bit more of an effort. There are tools like uh, Selenium, Fit and Fitness that will do automation at the acceptance and uh, functional layers. And so what happens is these three layers, uh, we want automated. What that means is that this top right, where it's showcase exploratory usability testing, that's where we want to focus our manual testing on. In a, a mature environment, we're not necessarily getting rid of manual testing, but what we want to do is what we can automate, let the machines do, we would do. And what we want the people to do is focus on this top right quadrant, the showcase exploratory and usability testing. Testing ends up being one of the most expensive parts of, um, of uh, rework. And what happens is uh, what we do is we don't, in 21st century, I'm no longer trying to minimize the volume of rework because I constantly should be refactoring. We're constantly modernizing. But what I want to do 21st century is minimize the cost of rework. And by using concepts like uh, automation at the integration level and at the test level allows us to reduce the cost of rework. Yeah. All right, last note here is uh, organizational alignment. So Kareem, this is where Kareem's book comes in, the six enablers of business agility. So Kareem has six dimensions broken out here. As these dimensions, I'm gonna all categorize as organizational alignment, which is kind of the culture, the structure, the people, governance funding, leadership management, as well as ways of working. Now, I know what Kareem would argue would be that um, these points here, what Kareem would say is these six points here all fun or ways of working, where it's really about the organization to align that really makes the magic happen. I think that's a valid point. I think that's a great point as well. And so I definitely recommend reading Kareem's book in terms of understanding how to get the organization aligned to understand a lot of these concepts, right? And here's another super graphic that helps with that. Out on Amazon now, is that true, Kareem? Shameless pre plug. Pre-order ships in seven days time. Ah, awesome. Well, shameless plug for the conference organizer, get Kareem's book. Um, so I'm going to conclude with a few things. I'm going to conclude with a concluding video. So let me give you one video to conclude. Three awesome MVPs. What are the greatest minimum viable products of all time? I've absolutely no idea, but here are three of my favorites. Hi, this is Gary. Welcome to Development That Pays. Today, we're going to take a look at three of my favorite examples of minimum viable products. Before diving in, let's establish some ground rules for a proper MVP. It's got to be minimal, it's got to be viable, and it's got to be a... Actually, no, it doesn't have to be a product. I'll be showing you a great example of a non-product in a minute or two. It has been argued that the word product in MVP is unhelpful. Steve Cohen has made a strong case for using the word experiment instead, and I have to say I agree. But for now, let's stick with the P and temporarily redefine it to premeditated, meaning that the MVP must be a deliberate attempt to learn about the market. This rules out cases that look like MVPs in retrospect, but were really full products that just happened, to everyone's surprise, develop into something big. Let's get going, starting at number three. It's Buffer. <coughs> Buffer is an application that makes it easy to share content on social media. Way back in the beginning, they put these two pages on their website. It's a test certainly, but at this point, not quite an MVP. The next version was better. They slotted this page in between the other two pages. Now visitors to the website are not just saying, this is interesting. They're saying, I want to buy this. In fact, there was nowhere for anyone to input credit card details or payment details of any kind. But anyone who got this far was at least prepared to think about parting with their money. As co-founder Joel Gascoigne said, after this result, I didn't hesitate to start building the first minimal version of the real functioning product. Minimal, yep. Viable, yep. Premeditated, yes, definitely. This was definitely an experiment. 
Buffer has gone on from this MVP to do really quite well. Its current valuation is something close to $400 million. Moving on to number two, it's Dropbox. Dropbox, as I'm sure you know, is a file synchronization service. Edit a file on your desktop, and seconds later, it's updated on all of your other devices. Rewind to the very early days of Dropbox. The team, entirely composed of techie types, had the basic synchronization working. That was the easy bit. The hard bit was going to be to achieve the same trick on every platform, Mac, Windows, Android, iPhone, etc., etc. Given that the team was all technical types, you'd have put your money on them diving straight in. Drew Houston, the CEO, did something surprising. He made a video. The video, just three minutes long, demonstrated the sync process end to end. But it was more than just a simple demo. It was full and of techie in-jokes designed to appeal to early system. adopters. Where you'll see that not only are the changes from my Mac already here, but if I make And it worked like a charm. In Drew's words, it drove hundreds of thousands of people to the website. Our beta waiting list went from 5,000 people to 75,000 people literally overnight. It totally blew us away. Minimal, yes, viable. Well, there wasn't a product that could be used, but there certainly was a product that could be demonstrated. Premeditated, yep, definitely an experiment. Dropbox also went on to do quite well. Its current valuation stands somewhere between five and $10 billion. It's time for my number one pick, it's Zappos. It's 1999, co-founder Nick Swinmurn, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, wanted to build an online store for shoes. But would people use it? Here's how he went about finding out. He popped down to his local shoe stores, he went in to each of the stores, and he, and I shit you not, he photographed pairs of shoes. The photographs were uploaded to a super simple website. If someone clicked on a button to buy a pair, Nick would pop down to the store where he took the photo and buy the shoes. What I love about this one is that behind the scenes, there's pretty well zero infrastructure, almost zero inventory. And yet from the customer's point of view, everything appears to be perfectly in place. Minimal, definitely. Viable, well, this time it's not even up for discussion. Definitely viable. Real customers, real money changing hands, real shoes being shipped. Premeditated? Yes, of course. Zappos went on to do quite well. They were acquired by Amazon in 2009 for a cool $1.2 billion. Buffer, Dropbox, and Zappos, three of my favorite MVPs. What do you think of my choices? Any you disagree with? Let me know in the comments down below. I'd also like to hear about your favorites. Let me know in the comments and I'll feature the best ones in a future episode. Thank you very much for watching and I look forward to talking to you next time. So we saw there in the, the video that in terms of building a product, right? The concept of MVP, if you, especially if you think about a lean startup approach is really about what, how do I test out my product, right? It's not so much a sliver of functionality, but a sliver of learning, a sliver of value, a sliver of delivery, some way to test out my concept. Uh, let me go back to my slides real quick. A couple of quick notes as we conclude. I do want to highlight uh, the difference between design thinking and lean startup. Uh, design thinking really has a focus on thinking about your users first and empathizing them, understanding their needs, whereas lean startup is really more about identifying your key assumptions uh, you know, mapping those out and testing through those assumptions and they flow really well together. Agile, design thinking, lean startup, scrum, all flow and fit really well to each other. Uh, and it's not mutually exclusive. I think doing all of them uh, on the same team on the same products has some great benefits. Uh, now to conclude a couple quick thoughts back to Mike Beadle. Um, so uh, I remember I heard him give a talk once and what he said was something, I may butcher these words, but something along lines is, as I look around this room, I see some dinosaurs. Uh, some of you are, uh, your companies are gonna die. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next year, but your company right now is a walking dinosaur. It's gonna fall over at some point, which is fine because what we need is for unicorns to come up, we need the dinosaurs to die out. Um, and what we wanna be able to do is put the practices in place that move us away from being these dinosaurs uh, into closer to being the unicorns. Uh, some recommended reading. Uh, here are some books I found to be very interesting. Uh, Steve Denning's uh, Radical Guide to Leader's Guide to Radical Management has a lot of these concepts in there. The Phoenix Project is a great book that kind of works through a, a really good fictionalized hypothetical. 
uh, Kareem's new book, available now pre-order from Amazon. Uh, shout out to Kareem, Six Enablers of Business Agility. Um, oh, also take my training classes, thanks to my organization. It's 1.30 p.m. my time, so thanks for the organization to let me come out and give this talk today. Uh, let me copy and paste my contact information once again for you. So if you want to reach out to me, feel free to do so. All right, and with that said, let's move over to the q and I'm gonna open it up to questions and thoughts from the group. Also, not just questions and thoughts, but if anyone has experiences with lean startup, design thinking, DevOps, continuous integration, automation, and wanna share some of your uh, um, experiences, feel free to do that as well. Opening it up to the group. Thanks, Richard. Before we do, I'm just going to plug this book, which is definitely not mine, but um, Testing Business Ideas by David Bland. You referenced David Bland. Uh, it's just a super cool way of a uh, uh, set of patterns where you can cheaply, quickly validate your assumptions through tests. And uh, if you're into that stuff, I'd definitely check it out. Uh, super useful as, an, as, a, as a compliment to all of those. But uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Um, questions, folks. Now's the time. Let's put, let's put the man to the test. Sure. Uh, Rich, great presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, Sasan, quick note. So Sasan over here actually did a version of this presentation with me where he presented out some of the DevOps concepts. So shout out to Sasan. Uh, thanks for doing that presentation with me a few months ago. Sure, great, thank you. Uh, one of the uh, major challenges, uh, specifically with the Karim actually uh, books about the organization enablers, when we are talking about the MVP link practice within the large size organization. The Roscopoli example, which is absolutely correct, you brought it at the beginning of this in a presentation, Uber versus the established cap companies, or for example, a Marriott versus the Airbnb and other actually companies like this. Uh, so today in the today uh, business uh, market, everybody thinks about as the large size organization, how they can implement the uh, lean practice within their organization. Uh, and there are lots of uh, study and test cases and also uh, practices in the market to suggest, but when you come back to the large size organization, it's hard to break the walls between those organization cluster to practice some of the uh, lightweight or lean practice, which is the next wave of the you know, business. For example, Marriott, if they had the thought that, hey, Airbnb is coming in the next couple of the months or years, let's have that practice inside as the MVP inside the organization. Uh, my question specifically is, if you are working as the agile coach or the scrum master or the lean practitioner in large size organization, what was actually, what would be the, those practical, you know, way that you can break down the walls and starting actually developing new concept, new product based on the lean practice? Yeah, so I think that's a great question, especially when talking about a large enterprise. And I think the first answer I'm gonna give is regardless of whether you're in a large enterprise or a small or midsize, it's basically, we gotta understand why we're doing it. What's the need, right? Because if there's no need to do it, why are we doing this, right? And so, uh, you know, like Simon Sinek says, start with why. So, uh, you know, well, how do we work today, right? Is it working well for us? What's the danger of the way we work today? And based on that, why should we move to these concepts, right? And once we can form a strong argument around that and get leadership to buy in that argument, that's when we can really start making some changes at the organization level. Because what happens is organizational changes start with the top. If you start with the grassroots, you can do some things at the grassroots, but you can, that happens more locally versus the organization. If you're going to shift the enterprise, it's got to start at the top, and they got to understand why we're going to need to do it. Right? Um, now, with that said, uh, I love the lean concept. I think it's a lean concept of think big, act small. Right, And so what I love is the concept um, where we can start off with a few pilots, do some proof of concepts, take those patterns and start extending that out. I like that idea for a large enterprise. One of the enterprises I'm working with right now is a company called uh, Progressive Insurance. Um, for those in the US who might be familiar with their large uh, uh, home and auto insurance that they're primarily known for, um, they're over 40,000 people in terms of their company size. And what I, what I think they're doing really well right now is they're actually doing very well right now. They're thriving, they're profitable, they're doing very good. And what they're doing right now is they're investing in their um, agile and business agility infrastructure because what they realize is they don't want to be a Marriott or a yellow, uh, yellow top cab company, right? What they see is they can see like 
their analysis says that although they're successful right now, uh, the insurance market is one that is set up for disruption. Right. And there are companies right now that are starting to disrupt the insurance market, more crowdsourced, more peer to peer type funding. There's something called like Lime or Lemonade that's doing a lot of the stuff. And so they can see it coming. And what they realize is, look, we need to invest it now before it gets here, because if we start investing into this once it's already here, it's already too late. Right. And so what Progressive is doing so well, which is very hard for an enterprise to do, is although there's no crucial need right now to do it. They want to do it now while they can, because by the time the crucial needs arises for them to do it, for a company that size, it's going to be too late for them to move all at once as a reactive mode, right? So those are some thoughts off the top of my head. Kareem, it's your book too. Do you have some thoughts on that as well? Great. Thank you, Rich. Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. But I'd rather we don't, we've only got a few more minutes left. And uh, um, as I am uh, speaking next month at, uh, at my own meetup, um, I'm, I'm going to try and say as little as possible, because I'd like to mine your brain. But I am, I, I've got a question for you. I, what, quite often in my classes, people say, I get what you're saying. I'd love to do some of this stuff. But I work in government. And in government, this stuff is a, a nightmare to do. Now, I know you, that you're in the DC area, you've done a lot of stuff um, in government. I, I wonder if you could share some success stories of, of, of uh, government departments that have really done this well. Yeah, and that's what you, you hit upon the key thing is, is success stories. So um, what happened was years ago, I used to work at The Motley Fool. You guys familiar with The Motley Fool? Fool.com is a website, their financial advising website. That was a lot of fun. That place was great. They have like two game rooms, both or any one of their game rooms better than half the sports bars in town. There's always free food, always free alcohol there. It was great. And they do agile top down throughout the entire organization. But the reason I bring that up is I went straight from there to working at a government facility. I went straight from there to working at the government facility here in the US, a uh, government agency called OPM, Office of Personal Management. It was like night and day. It was like going from a happy, bright, cheery place to a big, gray, drab government building. So it was a little depressing at first. I felt like I was the only person there trying to do agile. And it felt overwhelming and depressing. And there's no free food, no free alcohol anywhere. Um, but what happened was I started finding other people in the building that were doing similar things, and we started chatting. Then what happened was I found other people in other government agencies doing similar things, and we started chatting. And at the time, we actually formed our own group, which is uh, called ADAPT, I'll put in the chat window. So at the time, it was Agile Delivery. Well, at the time, it was Agile Defense Adoption Proponents Team. Because originally, when we started, we were chartered by the Department of Defense as a joint task force with government agencies. Uh, but it was a joint task force between uh, government agencies to help promote Agile concepts. And through that, we got a lot of Agile stories and, and, uh, and case studies and stuff. And what happens is, when we're doing Agile in government, it's a lot easier to say, hey, these folks over here do it, and here's how they do it here. These folks are able to work through this procurement issue, this kind of um, governance issue, this requirement, this authority issue through these patterns. And so the best thing to do is to uh, kind of pick up stories as you go, and so you can share how other agencies are doing it, right? In fact, uh, that became so prevalent, and what happened was uh, Agile and government became very big here in the U.S. They have a friend of mine who was at the time a government employee, he started a private uh, email group of just government employees sharing agile concepts to each other. And so what they had there was, uh, for example, let's say that uh, we weren't trying to figure out how to structure a procurement contract that's government friendly, that's agile friendly as well. So we have about three or four people we knew on the government side that was really smart on this on the government side. So anyone that had questions about that, we direct them to those folks, right? So by doing that, it helped us kind of uh, show where areas of expertise was. So if government agencies struggled, we can have stories and people to refer back to to help work through the concepts. Great stuff. Thank you, Richard. We, it's, it's 7.29. I, I'm conscious that, the, that, it's, that it's close to our uh, time box, but I think we can probably squeeze one more question in if anybody has something, a burning question they'd like to get answered before they disappear off. Now's the time, speak now. Hi, Richard. Thanks for the incredible session. I put in a, a question in the post there, but uh, I don't think you saw it. I just wanted to uh, ask, I know you mentioned Agile, uh, but then focused on Scrum. Uh, how do Kanban practices fit into or enable uh, business agility? Yeah, I apologize. I didn't have time to go through uh, all the Agile methods, but I would suggest this, actually. Um, when you're doing Agile, uh, at the execution level, 
it's always going to be, um, let me show this slide here. So when you're doing agile at the execution level, it's either going to be scrum or some form of an iterative incremental framework or Kanban in its purest form, it's kind of a real-time pull system. So it's either going to be some form of scrum or an iterative incremental framework where you have the start, start and stop of sprints and iterations or some kind of like a pure Kanban where instead of your iterations, it's more of like a real-time flow system, right? So when you look at Kanban as a real-time flow system, I like Kanban a lot, especially in the context of stuff that's more operational, more transactional, uh, things like uh, help desk, uh, server maintenance, pure operation and maintenance, certain types of security, certain types of networking, certain types of database work, um, I think uh, work really well in a Kanban-based flow environment. Also, if your team is really effective in delivering uh, and you're finding that even one week sprints are uh, a little bit long for you, I think a Kanban-based flow approach is really good as well. And so I think uh, Kanban, I like a lot. Uh, I like Scrum a lot if I'm building something where I have a legitimate product vision that I'm building towards a bigger thing where I have a roadmap and release plans. I think Scrum is great, uh, but I love Kanban as well. I love it when it's a lot of its operational transactional work too. I kind of lost track of the original question, Femi. Did that help? Yeah, it did. It did. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks, Femi. Cheers. Thank you. Sorry, Femi, I, I missed your uh, missed your question in the chat there, but uh, but you got that in. Brilliant. Um, well, yeah, thank no, you. It's, yeah. it's seven thirty one, Richard. Thank you so much for that. That was super cool. Um, really, really useful stuff. And uh, I like how it kind of dovetails uh, nicely with some of the stuff we talk about from the organizational side, right? Because you got to come at this from all angles. So. Uh, Fantastic. Um, and thank you, everybody, for, for coming. Um, and uh, we are here again next month. As I've said, uh, you've got to put up with me talking next month um, about the six enablers of business agility. Hopefully, it's going to complement what Richard has said. That's going to be on Wednesday, the 23rd of June. If you're about, check it out. Um, I'll, be, uh, I'll, I'll be talking about a few bits and bobs um, and, and hopefully um, trying to, uh, to show you how you create the environment for this stuff to work. But for now, Richard, uh, much appreciated. Um, check out Richard's work out in DC. Uh, if you're in the area and you need a CSM or a CSPO or anything like that, he's your man to go to. Otherwise, uh, I'm going to let you all disappear off now. Thank you so much. Uh, we'll see you next month. Enjoy the rest of your evening, folks. Take care and stay safe. Bye.